Every now and again, as I'm researching the missing 411 phenomenon, which if you're not familiar, it's a book series by David Politis, who's a former police detective who researches the thousands of strange disappearances in national parks and forests across North America. As I'm researching these cases, I'll find one that is truly disturbing. And today's top story is just that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please befriend the like button. And when they hand you their phone for you to input your phone number, just Venmo yourself $1,000 and give their phone back. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1995, 37-year-old Jeannie Hesselschwert was living with her fiance, Mike Monahan, in Arlington, Massachusetts. The couple had been together for 10 years and their family said they really loved each other and they were a great couple. In July of that year, Jeannie and Mike left for a planned trip to Yosemite National Park in California to go backpacking and sightseeing. On July 9th, the couple arrived at Yosemite and they entered via this road that was only open during the summer. So as such, it was totally desolate and they were the only ones on this road. And they had about a two, two and a half hour drive until they reached the spot they were going to actually stop at. So they had the scenic drive up the road and about two hours into this drive, there was this turnout on the side of the road where a couple of other tourists were standing and sightseeing and Jeannie and Mike decided they wanted to pull over and get out and stretch their legs. So they pulled over in the turnout and when they got out, Mike said he wanted to walk down the trail a little ways to this area that apparently was good for bird watching. And Jeannie didn't want to do that. She wanted to walk in the other direction up to this overlook. And so they decided that they would each get to do their own activities. They'd be gone for 15 minutes and then meet back at the car. So Mike heads down and does his bird watching. And then after 15 minutes, he walks back up to the car expecting to see Jeannie, but she's not there. And this is 1995, neither of them had a cell phone. And so he can't just call her. And so he just stands by the car and waits. And so he's looking around waiting for her to reemerge out of the trail she had left on. But after 15 more minutes goes by and he still hasn't seen her, he walks up to some of the tourists that were there in the first place and he asks them, hey, have you seen this woman Jeannie? And he described what she looked like. And they said, no, we haven't seen her. And so he goes back to the car and now he's getting pretty anxious and he's looking around and he's just waiting for her to show up. And another 15 minutes goes by. So now she's 30 minutes late and he starts walking up the trail to see if he can find her. But he realizes the trail immediately spiders off in different directions. And so she could have gone in any one of these different pathways. And so at this point he decides, I have to get authorities involved, time is of the essence. And so he runs back to his car and he sees a park service employee emptying a trash can into a dumpster. And so he runs over to them and he says, you know, my fiance, Jeannie, she's gone. She's been gone for 30 minutes. Can you please get in touch with authorities and get people up here looking for her? Within 45 minutes of speaking to this employee, park rangers had made their way up to this area and they began talking to Mike and figuring out where she might have gone. And they start walking down the trail to look for her. But after an hour of not finding her, the park rangers would call in additional assistance from the police. The search for Jeannie would become the largest in Yosemite's history, expanding to 40 square miles with helicopters overhead and dog handlers on the ground and hundreds of volunteers combing this whole area. But despite the relatively quick response time and massive amount of manpower, they could not find Jeannie. After two weeks of looking everywhere for her, the only thing they were able to find were two boot prints that they believed belonged to Jeannie. The first print was found in the vicinity of where their car was parked, so where she had actually disappeared from. And then the other one was curiously located on a trail that was one of the biggest trails in Yosemite. It was very well marked, it was fairly wide. You're not gonna mistake this for anything other than a trail. And the boot print was not walking along the trail. It was cutting across it as if she was going from woodline, crossing over the trail into the other woodline. This second print didn't make any sense to authorities because they're thinking, you know, if you're lost out in the middle of the woods and you come across a clearly defined trail, a really obvious, obvious trail, you wouldn't walk across it and go back into the woods you would take the trail in either direction until it hits civilization because all trails do that for the most part. And so it seemed like this print could not be hers because that would indicate she has chosen not to follow this path, but the print was hers. 
Over the course of these two weeks of searching, several dog teams had been placed right where Mike's car had been, right where Jeannie had left to go to the trail where she disappeared. And the dogs could not pick up a scent of Jeannie. And it led the handlers to believe that Mike was actually lying and that Jeannie had actually never been in Yosemite. And this was all a big ploy because he had done something to her and he was gonna act like she's lost in the wilderness and he was gonna get away with whatever he did to her. And so ultimately the FBI got involved because because now foul play is being suggested. And the first thing the FBI did is they polygraphed Mike and he passed without question. And he was totally vindicated of any involvement. After that, the FBI dug into Mike's background and Jeannie's background to see if there was any indication of somebody that might want to do Jeannie harm and they couldn't find anything. She was just gone and nobody knew what happened to her. On September 3rd, so two months after Jeannie went missing, two men were in this really remote section of Yosemite to go fishing when they spotted a human body in a pool of water. It would turn out to be Jeannie's. She was three miles from where she was last seen by Mike at that trailhead. She was only wearing socks and one boot and she had been sitting in this pool of water for so long that they were unable to determine a cause of death. Initially, it was speculated that she must have fallen into the river that fed ultimately down to where she was found. She must have fallen into that river, you know, miles away, close to where she went missing. Maybe she fell and hit her head and was unconscious, and then she drowned, and then she wound up here. But park officials said there's too many debris along this waterway that her body would never have been able to get down to this spot. But if she didn't drift to that spot, it meant she had to have gotten there on foot. And to get to this particular spot, according to the fishermen that were interviewed after they found her, the only way to get there is to climb up a cliff with climbing gear on or scale down a cliff again with climbing gear on. The only people that go fishing in this area are mountain climbers and rock climbers that have the equipment to get there. From where Jeannie went missing, she would have had to climb down 2,000 feet of cliff face to get to this spot, and she did not have climbing gear. And so when that seemed really unlikely, the next theory was, okay, she must have been abducted, and, and they brought her here. But that means your assailant would have had to carry genie down this 2,000 foot cliff, which also seems really unrealistic. The most widely accepted theory was put forth by a tracker that was involved in this case. They went out and they surveyed the area where Jeannie would have been, and they noticed that the sound the wind made when it passed by this particular clump of aspen trees, when the wind hit the leaves in the trees, it sounded like a car driving by. And so they speculated that maybe, you know, Jeannie, she's scared, you know, she's panicking, it's nighttime, and she hears this sound and she thinks she's hearing a road. And so she would have walked towards the sound of, you know, the car, which really was the leaves, and she would have disregarded, for example, the trail. She would have walked over the trail because she's trying to get down to this road. She's kind of fixated on this road. And at some point she could have potentially wound up at the side of that cliff that would have led down to where she was found. And then she could have slipped and fallen over the edge and landed in one of the rivers that would have flowed down to where she was found. But park officials and authorities were a little bit skeptical of this theory because for her to have landed in a stretch of water that did connect to where she was found, it was almost like she would have had to leap off the cliff to land in that stretch of water. It wouldn't have been just falling over the edge and then you're landing in this water. It would have been more of a jump to get to it. So the idea that, you know, Jeannie is running and leaping off cliffs, that doesn't really add up either. But park officials and authorities, they don't have a better theory. In fact, no one has a better theory. We're just left with a lot of questions like, how did she wind up in this inaccessible area? Why didn't the dogs pick up her scent? Why didn't she take that trail down to safety? Why did she cross over it? Unfortunately, we'll probably never know the answer. On September 19th, 2013, 69-year-old retired middle school teacher Amy Linkert and her friend, 63-year-old Joe Blakesley, who was a physician, headed off to the Craters on the Moon Park in Idaho. This park is actually a dormant volcano. It's not extinct. It's going to be active again probably in the next 1,000 years. But for now, it's this beautiful park that is known for these crazy lava fields that look otherworldly. You know, barely any vegetation can grow on them. And there's just a strip of, of pavement they've kind of weaved through these massive jagged lava fields. And then you have all these big mounds that are the actual volcanoes. Another feature of this park are all the lava tubes underground. All the molten lava, when it jets around underneath the surface before shooting out, it carves these natural tunnels underground, these huge, 
caverns. They're like these big caves you can explore. And there's 1,100 miles of lava tubes, tunnels, and caves underneath this park. The two women told their families they would be back in Boise, Idaho by the 21st. But when the 21st came and they were not home, their families were suspicious. They tried calling them, they didn't pick up. And for the next 36 hours, they just kept trying to call them and you know called around to see if anybody else knew where they were. And then finally, on the morning of the 23rd, when no one knew where they were, they reached out to the authorities. The formal search for these two women began on the 24th, so five days after they had initially left for this trip. And the searchers quickly found their pickup truck parked in the parking lot of the Craters on the Moon Park. And in their truck were their two dogs who were alive, they were okay, and in the front seat were their purses and their cell phones. But there was no sign of Amy or Joe. This was obviously a bad sign, and so the search was really kicked into high gear to see if they could find these women before it was too late. But unfortunately, within 24 hours of finding the truck, they would find Amy's body. And her body was located way off of the main trail. She was in an area that the park superintendent described as incredibly rugged and inaccessible. Now at this park, there is a strip of cement that weaves through this really dangerous lava field. And if you were on this strip of cement, you wouldn't be thinking about walking onto the lava field. Not only would you need to navigate all these massive mounds of jagged, cooled lava, there's all these cracks in the ground that you could fall through and just plummet to your death. So no one's about to start walking off the trail, especially not two older women that went here just to have a casual stroll through the park. They were not there for some grand adventure. They were not athletic distance hikers. It made no sense that Amy would be so far off the trail in an area that was so dangerous and so clearly off limits. When the families were notified that Amy had been found and they were still looking for Joe, the detail that the family keyed in on was the idea that these two women left their dogs in the truck. That was something so unbelievably uncharacteristic of either of them. They adored those two dogs. They would never, ever abandon them like that. In fact, because of that detail, the families jumped to this has to be foul play because they never would have done that. They wouldn't have abandoned these precious dogs. The search for Joe would continue. They basically shifted the entire effort to center over Amy where she was found and work in circles out from there to see if they could find her. They had helicopters flying overhead. They had mining experts walking through all the lava tubes below and they couldn't find her. Finally, on October 23rd, so 28 days after Amy was found, Joe's body was discovered as well and she was lying one mile away from where Amy had been found in a similarly inaccessible part of the park that would have required significant climbing over jagged, cooled lava fields and all these cracks in the ground she would have had to navigate to reach where she was. And even more strangely is the area where she was found had been searched extensively by air with helicopter pilots flying overhead and by cadaver sniffing dogs that had been in that area and they had not picked up her scent. So either the helicopter pilots and the cadaver sniffing dogs were just wrong or missed something, or Joe had not been there the whole time. A cause of death has not been determined for either of the two women. However, what was released is neither of them appeared to have suffered an incapacitating injury, meaning they weren't struck down where they were. They were traveling and ultimately stopped where they were. It seems highly unlikely that these two women abandoned their two dogs and left their cell phones in the car and then wandered way off the trail and separated from each other, all without supplies. But even if they had done that, even if they had, you know, separated and left the trail, where they ultimately reached seems like an area they would not have been able to get to without assistance. And since they were separated, they weren't able to help each other get where they were. So although authorities have ruled out foul play, this was deemed an accident, it does seem like if there was ever a place to commit an attack, it would be this particular park because underneath the park is 1,100 miles of lava tubes that connect to each other and weave all through the park. And there's hundreds of caves, many of which have not been found or explored, that it would be pretty straightforward to attack someone and then go underground and not be found. Certainly makes you wonder who or what could be hiding underground in those lava tubes. On March 7th, 1975, 21-year-old Mark Hansen, along with two of his friends from college, 
Ben Fish, and John Chidester arrived at a parking lot on the eastern side of the Appalachian Trail. All three of the young men were in incredible physical shape and were excited to spend their spring break challenging themselves on some of the trail's most rigorous hikes. The day before they were supposed to go, they almost canceled the trip because there was this terrible weather system that was coming over the trail. And they were thinking, you know, it's going to be dangerous. It's not such a good idea. And then they started talking some more and they were like, well, we're already going to, you know, challenge ourselves. It would be even more challenging to hike these really difficult trails with the inclusion of bad weather. So this is another way to, you know, test our abilities. And so they kind of got pumped up at the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail in terrible weather. So the guys arrive in the parking lot, you know, the windshield wipers are furiously working to keep the pouring rain off. They hop out and they're getting soaked by the rain. They put on their ponchos, they grab their heavy packs and they make their way over to the trail. Their plan was to move west along the trail until they hit the Tri-Corner Shelter where they would spend their first night. The Tri-Corner Shelter is one of the many shelters along the Appalachian Trail. They are open to the public. There's no heating or electricity but it provides shelter from the storm. You can go in there and you know get in a sleeping bag and you'll be fine. But to get to the Tri-Corner Shelter, they would need to hike 16 miles, almost completely uphill, walking right into the wind and it's raining on them and it's supposed to snow later on. So it's just a treacherous, treacherous first day. But they take off, they start walking up this trail and after a couple of miles, John says, you know what guys, this is awful. I think we should probably turn around. I think we've, we've underestimated how bad this is going to be. Let's go back to the car and we'll do this another time. But Mark and Ben were like, oh no, we are committed. We are doing this. We are not turning around. And John's like, you know what? Suit yourself. I'm not going to do that. And he turned around and he left and he went back to the car and he would pick them up when they were done. After John turned around, Mark and Ben, you know, they felt good. They felt tough. They're going to stick this hike out. And so they take off again and Ben's in the lead and Ben seems to be handling the poor weather and difficult hike and heavy pack a lot better than Mark is. In fact, over the next several hours, Mark would drift farther and farther back and Ben would need to wait for him and Mark would be hunched over, you know, really just struggling with this hike. And then at some point, Mark yells to him and says, I got to take my pack off. I can't carry this much weight up this hill until we get to the shelter. I'm not going to make it to the shelter. Then Ben would say to him, you know, if we don't get to the shelter for some reason, you're going to be stranded out here in this storm without any warm clothes, without your sleeping bag, without your tent, without your food, without your water. It's, it's way too dangerous. You have to keep your pack on. And so finally, Mark is convinced and he's like, oh, all right, puts his pack back on and they continue moving. About an hour later at 7 p.m., they had reached the section of the trail where they knew they were getting close-er, close-ish to the tri-corner shelter. They were certainly well beyond the halfway point, but it was dark out, the temperature had dropped significantly. At this point, Ben is basically Mark's cheerleader, kind of egging him on to keep moving, and Mark's kind of staggering along this trail, and Ben and Mark are just hoping that shelter just appears at some point here because they don't know how much farther they can go. Another hour and a half goes by, they still haven't made it to the shelter. Mark is groaning, he can barely move, it's pitch black, the rain has now completely shifted over to snow and it is just dumping snow on them. And Ben is concerned that, you know, somehow did we take a wrong turn, even though they were on a really well-marked trail and he, and he knew they hadn't. He figured they must be so close at this point. And it was around this time that Mark yells out to Ben, I'm done. I can't go any farther. And he sits down right in the middle of the trail. He's sitting down with his pack and he's just laying there. And Ben is like, come on, we're so close. You can't sit down now. And Mark's like, I'm not moving. I can't do any more. I'm going to sleep right here. Ben knows this is a bad idea. I mean, they did have warm clothes and sleeping bags and they probably would be just fine sleeping out in the middle of the trail. But it just seemed so unnecessarily risky when there's probably a shelter maybe a couple hundred meters away, and he would turn out to be right. And so he decides he's gonna walk ahead on the trail and he's gonna see if the shelter's there, but he only went about a hundred meters. He was within maybe a hundred meters of the actual shelter, but he never saw it. And so after going ahead and, and feeling like, man, I don't wanna drag Mark any farther, you know, if there's no shelter ahead, for all we know, we took a wrong turn. And so he turns back around and he goes back near Mark, not next to him, but close enough to him that he can see him. And he sits down on the trail too. He gets his sleeping bag out. He crawls inside and he falls asleep. That night, Ben would have this vivid, horrible nightmare where he heard Mark screaming for help, yelling for Ben to come save him as he's being dragged off the trail into the forest. 
And it scared him so much that Ben woke up and he looks down the trail to where Mark is and he can see Mark's backpack is sitting right on the trail. And so he thinks, oh, Mark's still there. And he's so tired, he's not about to get up and go check. He's like, that was just a dream. And he goes back to sleep. The next morning when the sun comes up, Ben gets up again. And the first thing he does is he looks over at Mark and he sees the pack, but he realizes that Mark is not there. It's just the backpack. And so Ben jumps up and he yells for Mark. He doesn't get a response. He's looking around thinking he's gotta be around here, but he's not. It snowed that night. So any tracks Mark would have left to show where he went to were now covered up. And that's when it dawns on Ben that that dream he had the night before, that might've been real. And he has this sinking feeling that something horrible has happened to Mark and that he didn't save him. And so he thinks, I gotta get authorities. He grabs his bag. He leaves Mark's there because he's thinking maybe he'll come back and he'll grab it. And Ben turns and runs down the trail in the direction he hopes is towards this tri-corner shelter. And he can't believe it when literally 200 meters away, he finds the tri-corner shelter. They were that close. And inside are other hikers. He was able to get one of them to run down and get park services to know that they have a missing hiker on the trail. Searchers were dispatched to the area where Mark and Ben had been sleeping on the trail. The first thing they did is they went to his bag and inside were all the things he would need to survive out in the wild. His tent, his warm clothes, his sleeping bag, his food, his water, everything. It was all left there. Over the next few days, hundreds of searchers combed the area, they had helicopters overhead, and they made no significant discovery. However, one park ranger discovered this huge cave that was not that far away from where they had been sleeping. And inside of this cave, this ranger said a large mammal had been staying recently, it was not there now, and there was all these animal bones inside the cave. So it was obviously a predator of some kind. And so there was speculation that between this cave that probably held, you know, a bear or something like that, and Ben's dream that probably was reality of Mark being pulled off the trail screaming for help, that maybe Mark was attacked by some animal that dragged him away. On the ninth day of the search, Mark's body was found. It was located three miles down the hill from where he and Ben had been sleeping up on that trail. Mark was positioned up against a tree. His jacket was open, his gloves were off and his boots were off and they were placed right next to him. An autopsy concluded he must have died within 24 to 36 hours of leaving that trail. So there's lots of questions with this one, namely, why did Mark in the middle of the night get up, not tell Ben where he was going and then leave the trail and walk three miles away? The trail they were on was very well worn that even at night in a snowstorm, it would be very obvious if you were on the trail or if you were off the trail. If you look at this picture, this is a section of the trail they were on. This is not the literal place they were at, but this is a good representation. As you can clearly see, there is a trail that runs down the middle, and then there is the forest to the side of that trail. That if you were to leave the trail, you'd be bumping into trees left and right. It would be very obvious you were off the trail. So Mark had to have known he was leaving the trail. But even if Mark had a great reason for wanting to leave the trail, just hours earlier, he couldn't even stand. That's why they were even laying on the trail to begin with, because he couldn't go any farther. So the idea that he can just jump up in the middle of the night and navigate this really difficult terrain for three miles in total darkness in the snow, that doesn't make sense either. And then you have Ben's dream where he hears Mark screaming for help and he's yelling for Ben to come save him as he's getting dragged off the trail. There's a good chance what Ben was hearing and seeing in his dream was actually playing out just several feet away from him down the trail. So David Politis and the other people involved in the search they all believe the key to understanding what happened to Mark is what caused him to scream for help and potentially what pulled him off the trail and dragged him three miles away. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please befriend the like button. And when they give you their phone for you to enter your number in, go ahead and Venmo yourself a thousand dollars and then give them their phone back. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. 
See ya.